Welcome to the world of religion. We can see that religion is often known as a love boat, but it can also be a hate boat as we know. And I prefer to see religion, this bad boy term anymore, uh, more in terms of worldviews. Everyone has a worldview or else you'd be dead. So classically, religion was thought to be that which binds a human on earth to God. That was a pretty Christian-centered definition, or certainly monotheistic definition. Whereas some religions like Buddhism or Taoism have no God, so then we have to determine what is religion if there's no God. Is it not a religion? Is it a philosophy? What's the difference? And that's where religion and philosophy can both be classed as worldviews. So everyone has one, and we can define religion as that which binds not just man or human to God, but people to each other in groups of like-minded believers and thinkers. When we look at the history of religion or worldviews, we can see the evolution taking place among them. For example, 20,000 years ago, even not that long ago, and even today, all worldviews of humans were governed by what we call shamanism, or tribal religion. So just as at one point in the Earth's history there were only fishes among living things, at a certain point, 10,000 plus years ago, all the worldviews of humans were governed by what we call shamanism, or tribal religion. And the shaman is a person who guides individuals from this world to the sacred realm where ghosts and fairies and all the things we can't see in our world are alleged to exist. The shaman also acts as a mystic, a poet, a doctor, even a guide to the hunt for the shaman and the tribe. Early civilizations spring up around the planet, starting in Sumer, spreading to Egypt, the Indus Valley in India, and China, and the Yellow River. At this point, we see worldviews or religions mirroring the city-states of those ancient periods. Very typically, we'll see a god like Zeus as the mayor of the city, with his department ministers again mirroring the city and the clergy become more distant and remote and no longer live among the people quite like the shaman did among the tribes people. And the shaman would have other mundane jobs as well as that of spiritual healer. So after the age of fishes, we can see the emergence of amphibians on land, half water, half land. And so these we can liken to those city-state religions which evolved out of the shaman or tribal phase. And after this, just as we can see here, the age of reptiles. Then there comes a time when cultures develop pan-ethnic empires out of collections of conquered cities. And then we see the rise of what we normally call religion in the middle of the first millennium. And uh, this is the period of time when Buddha and Confucius Socrates all emerged to shape massive societies globally, or at least regionally. We can see the, the age of man, the age of humans, better put, uh, emerging after that, and what is that? I submit, as do uh, scholars such as Fraser and Tyler, that that is the world of science. And science is the one world view that links humans around the planet regardless of their faith or ethnicity. So we can see humans began their long trek out of Africa. We can say, of course, all human races that exist today are African. That's right. There aren't even any real human races. There are races of squirrel and the like. There are zebras and horses but when they mate, they cannot produce offspring. So they are not the same race like all humans alive today are. 
So let's take a look at that and then we'll look at some of the structures of shamanism that affect these early human people. So here's a little overview of the many different human races that existed in the past but no longer exist. Only Homo sapiens is left, but the others, I'm certain, had some worldview as well. Because without a worldview, like a computer without an operating system, brains don't function. So we can see the Neanderthals, ancestors of Europeans especially, but also Asians as well, evolved during the ice ages of Europe as a tough and hardy breed of human. I suppose it's not too difficult to tell the Neanderthal from the Homo sapien, but we can see the residuum of the Neanderthal in modern humans for sure. Asians were blessed with the further evolute from the Neanderthal of the Denisovan human race, uh, which predominated in East Asia all the way through to the Philippines and the like. So these ancestors and their worldviews live on in us today. We might think we're modern, advanced scientists, all of us, but the truth is, if you do this for good luck, then you're hearkening back to the ancient primitive or primitive ways of our ancestors. So some tend to think there are human races. We can look around the planet and see people who look darker than other people. We can see different facial shapes, different noses, different brow ridges, lip shapes, you name it. But when it comes to this issue of skin color, it's all strictly on how much UV2 or ultraviolet 2 rays your ancestors received as your people evolved wherever they did evolve. We can see this chart of UV2 rays on our planet and uh, we can see clearly those receiving more ultraviolet light are going to be darker to develop the pigmentation required to protect themselves. Whereas those in Europe with very little sunlight evolved uh, this pale skin to absorb vitamin D more effectively. And same with pale eyes are meant for foggy weather like this young lady here we can see sunny people like this Cambodian woman evolved in a sunny climate. Likewise, this African evolved where UV2 rays are the most extreme. And you can see in this matchup of Chinese and Italian people that their skin complexion's about the same because the UV2 rays were the same. So when we think of worldviews, they're not in the least structured by genetics or what we erroneously think of as race. Just as a Windows operating system can be put into a, a, a Sony or a Dell or a Toshiba, you can install Christianity or Buddhism into any human consciousness. Of course, one of the things that modern scientists say accounts for our advance over the other human races is the emergence of this big brain with its advanced linguistic skills and ability to think abstractly. We can see already uh, after the cognitive revolution changed Homo sapiens in Africa to be the better competitors of their Neanderthal and Denisovan cousins that even 75,000 years ago in South Africa, they were drawing abstract symbols. And this abstraction, and this all leads directly into the study of human worldviews that are the global awareness competencies this course is meant to impart. So we can look at two categories of every human existence, the profane and the sacred. Profana means before the temple. So things that take place outside the temple that have nothing to do with anything sacred or important. Things like brushing your teeth, driving your car to work, talking with a friend, these are profane activities because they're not sacred or special. What is the sacred, we can ask. 
For some, the sacred could be Elvis, Michael Jackson, a movie star, celebrity. Look at how the fans react when they appear. Likewise, it could be a sports team. There have been wars waged in South America over soccer games, for example. So this is the same kind of energy, tribal, ethnic power that emerges when we look at sports teams like we do the world of religions. So your worldview determines your culture's trajectory. It's beyond your control to dismiss or ignore your worldview or your religion if you believe in one, a traditional religion. So we're all religious because we all have some idea of the sacred, even if it's a cabin in the woods. And of course, the sacred manifests itself in our world through a variety of means, different places, objects, figures. Um, these can all be objects of veneration representing important aspects of a worldview valued by a megaculture. In particular, when we look at sacred figures, we can see three main types. The prophetic, like Moses or Muhammad especially, who receive messages from God and then share them with the people. Or we have mystical worldview figures, such as the Buddha or Lao Tzu. Uh, these are figures who look within for truth. And this could involve meditation, uh, but they're not focused on a monotheos or a one God ruling the universe. The individual has within themselves all they need for the ultimate sacred reality. Then finally, we have the sacramental religious figures. Uh, we can think of Jesus, first of all, who is half man, half God, but he's not the only one. There is also Krishna of Hinduism, who is all God, yet all human at the same time. But historically, there was Hercules, or Heracles, Dionysus, and so many God-men. But it's not just God-men. Any appearance of the sacred in our world, like communion, if you believe in transubstantiation, uh, this then is a sacramental approach to understanding religion. Likewise, among the worldviews of humankind, we have cultures that look at a linear view of time and space, that the world had a beginning and an end. We can think of Genesis and Revelation, but also Judaism and Islam share the same linear perspective. God is working on a timeline and will culminate everything into perfection at a future date. But cyclical time frames involve repetition of cosmic cycles. This could range from the Hindu cosmic universe cycles, and we see them in Buddhism and Jainism also, uh, to just the changing of the seasons that we saw in the tribal religion. And similarly, in the Abrahamic traditions, we look at our lives in a linear manner. I was born, I'll die, and I'll go to heaven or hell. But from the cyclical point of view, I was born many trillions of times already and I am tired. So among the worldviews of humans, explaining the beginning, the origins of everything is always a critical element. We see many creation stories. Hinduism has numerous creation stories. But in the oldest myths, and a myth is not a falsehood like we use it today, which is a scientific negative judgment on religion. Myth means a story, real or not, doesn't matter. A story packed with cosmic meaning. And so we can see uh, among the variety of Hindu creation myths, we're told that we're part of God's very body. That's quite a different story from the Abrahamic religion's view of a creator deity. But the earliest creation story we have on record is that from Sumer, the first civilization on Earth where we hear of a cosmic mountain emerging from a primordial sea to make this planet. And if we think about it, in the end, the Big Bang Theory is kind of similar. 
the emergence of a mountain is that white hole or whatever it is that gave rise to the Big Bang. And the cosmic sea is all that space into which it all flowed. So the ancients weren't the dummies. Some often think they were. So now when we think about theories about these worldviews, these religions, um, we can think of two main approaches, substantive or phenomenological, uh, most famously espoused by uh, the great scholar Mircea Eliade, uh, where we're looking at the content of the belief of someone, their own individual perspective and how that shapes their world. We're not judging whether their view or belief is right or wrong. Uh, we're simply describing it. And out of the descriptions, we can see general patterns emerge among the different communities of faith. So that is the function, the, the substantive and phenomenological. And Eliade was especially noted for his work on the shaman. This mystic priest, poet, and doctor to a tribe I think uh, certainly Jesus of Nazareth fills the bill for a shaman, as do they all, and even modern clergy and monks today still are remnants of the ancient shamans of the past. And George Lindbeck was the one who defined religion as a primary worldview that dictates the thoughts and actions of an individual, and I would add, of whole societies as well. And so again, we can see just as there are many operating systems, there's only the one human race into which to place them. So while there's the phenomenological and substantive, the substance of faith is what that means, and phenomenological just means the phenomena as they appear to my mind as a researcher or as a person. The opposite is more externally focused, the functionalist approaches. So the functionalists, they're looking for the ways in which religion functions in society. Now, again, whether they're right or wrong, but for example, we could say from the field of economics, um, religion functions for Karl Marx as an oppressor by the rich of the poor, but for Max Weber, religion and Puritan Protestantism in particular functions to generate income and a powerful economic system. Who's right, who's wrong? That's for you to decide. But there are many ways in which religion functions in society. These two schools debate each other, but it's a bit like the nature-nurture argument, and I think it's both, personally. We just noted the two ways the economists, Marx and Weber, thought about religion opposite views, and yet they're both correct from their point of view. Most students end up agreeing with both of them. Likewise, functionally in terms of society, religion functions for individuals and groups as well. And so when we think about religion, many modern scoffers will suggest, like Freud did, that religion is a crutch for the weak-minded. Whereas Eric Erickson, his opponent in this debate, if not his student in reality, uh, says that no, religion shapes people to become culture transcending mega heroes like Martin Luther or the Buddha or you name it. So the religious figures, far from being weak minded and infantile, uh, are in fact the psychologically strong in a culture. Ruth Benedict, famous anthropologist studying tribal peoples in Papua New Guinea, found that cannibalism is not only not bad, it's positively a blessing. The tribe focuses on the ritual slaying of humans as part of a sacred ritual. And that's when she realized that from an anthropological perspective, all morality is relative much as many believers think their ethical systems are normative or the truth for all time. Many modern functionalists like Mary Daly studied the role of gender in religion, so long neglected and covered in our course. 
Of course, it's been traditional in Europe uh, to worship a father god, but this is not true in the entire planet. We'll find Taoism lying at the extreme opposite end of that patriarchal view of the Abrahamic religions, asserting that male and female are indispensable equally to the universe's functions, like light and dark, moist and dry, men and women, all make up one reality and the, as the Tai Chi, or the universal absolute. Neglected in the West, but not by my advisor, Dr. Yamada, uh, who brought in Watsuji, who observed that climate also shapes culture. We can see pretty clearly, for example, the celebration of Christmas. Well, that's not really Jesus' birthday. That's the time of the winter solstice, when the sun seems to have died for three days, and then it grows anew after the third day. It's resurrected, one could say. And we find this similar festival, same time, in China with the Dongji Festival. So those are clearly governed by climate. But more than that, religions like Buddhism or Christianity are also shaped by the climates in which they evolve. We can even see on this world map, the regions of Earth are separated into areas that ghostily reflect the religions of the world as well. And Ernst Trouch will speak about uh, the existence of cult evolving into sect, evolving into church. Every religion like Islam, Buddhism, Christianity starts uh, with a cult centered around a charismatic figure uh, who creates a following. The cult isn't necessarily good or bad, even though it has a bad connotation in modern American English, but they all start that way, whether good or bad. And after a period of time, after the death of the founder, certain sects emerge disputing what the founder really meant. So we can see this with Sunni and Shiite in Islam, Theravada, Mahayana in Buddhism, and this goes on and on. And then in time, one, maybe more of the sects emerge into a state church, in some cases like Shiite Islam in Iran or Theravada Buddhism in Thailand. But most sects will simply fade away or linger uh, for centuries. And then related to this sociological analysis, we can see Peter Berger famed for his thesis that reality is socially constructed, basing his work off of Durkheim, who once famously said, religion is society's worship of itself. Durkheim noted that we speak languages we didn't invent, sing songs we didn't write, and everything is given to us by our culture. Peter Berger realized, um, in parallel with Trulch's idea, that a certain individual may externalize a message from within, from that sacred center they may have, and after uh, externalizing the message, like again, Muhammad, the Buddha, Confucius counts, the followers objectify the statements of the founder into concrete works like the Quran or the New Testament or uh, the Pali Canon. Then his third phase was internalization, where future thousands and even millions of people internalize that message externalized by the original founder. And it's a remarkable fact that these figures configure the thinking of more than five billion humans. A rather daunting thought to realize that our thoughts were given to us by other people. And then I mentioned this earlier, the Axial Age, Carl Jaspers' observation that in the middle of the first millennium BCE, pan-ethnic empires have emerged like Alexander the Great's empire, the Babylonians and the like. 
had many people within them, so the city-state religions just didn't do. And we have these culture-questioning figures like Socrates challenging um, certain knowledge with his skepticism, or Confucius in China challenging the corruption of officials and the idea that greed should govern societies, or the Buddha in India opposing the caste system and asserting, like these others, the equality of beings in a pan-ethnic empires, this makes more sense. And here's a visual representation of all the heroes, the superheroes, we can say, of the Earth's world views from Hinduism, then Buddhism and Jainism, uh, over to the Chinese land of three religions, where one can belong to multiple religions not just one, uh, ending with the Abrahamic religions there, where in fact, you're not allowed to be a Jewish Muslim or a Christian Muslim or a Muslim Jewish person. You're kind of forced to pick. But what they all have in common are universalizing themes that can cement diverse peoples within an empire to operate under one operating system. Religion thinkers Tyler and Fraser see evolution, uh, not in individual terms like church, cult, sect, emerging into church, but rather all humankind starting at the level of magic and superstition in the tribal religions phase, evolving from there uh, to the religion phase where we can count the great axial age thinkers, the Buddha, Confucius, Socrates all emerge in the same middle of the first millennium BCE. And so, like many 19th century thinkers, uh, Fraser and Tyler also thought that science would be the next stage in the evolution from magic to religion to science. Then a few definitional terms are in order. We talked about tribalism and shamanism but we can also call it polytheism. This is the idea that deities exist in rocks, trees, uh, the sun, inanimate objects. Everything almost can become a deity. Shintoism is such a tradition, but Hinduism is not polytheistic, as I'll explain in a moment. Henotheism is that system of the city-states where one god predominates but doesn't control all of reality. We may recall in the Greek myths, Zeus was the all-powerful among the Olympians, but was inferior to the fates. He could not control past, present, and future, and thus was not the omnipotent creator of the universe, unlike Jehovah. And speaking of Jehovah, this God, Yahweh, or Jehovah, or the uh, God the Father of Christianity, or Allah of Islam, um, is the only deity and is not part of our world, is in no wise human or earthly. So there's a gap, we can say symbolized by the cross in a way, uh, a gap between the heavenly, the sacred, and the profane realm, the worldly, to use a Christian term, versus the heavenly. So with this perspective, we usually see the linear time frame as well. Monism is where we should place Hinduism, properly speaking, because behind all the gods and goddesses, there is one universalizing essence called Brahman, and all things are an aspect of this Brahman that underlies all reality. The Buddhists have emptiness, and the Taoists have the yin and yang, or tai chi symbol, to point to the oneness of everything. In this situation, there is no gap between the natural and the heavenly, or the worldly and heavenly. Uh, in this monistic worldview, where all things are part of one big system. Absolutely every religion that exists, exists as a product of syncretism mixing of beliefs. We can find countless Babylonian elements in the Hebrew Bible or the book of Genesis and 
um, the first five books of Moses. Likewise, what would Christianity be without Judaism or Islam without Christianity? Similarly, Buddhism without Hinduism and both of them without the Jain faith influencing them, the oldest of the three, they would not be what they are today if it weren't for the mixing. So don't let anyone ever tell you there's a pure faith on this planet. Then in the modern world, scientists like T.H. Huxley, who coined the term agnostic, said, I can't know if there's a God or angels or fairies, and you can't know either. Only science can prove things that are trustworthy and believable. More extreme than agnosticism is atheism, which uh, denies existence of God, not merely questioning it or saying we can't know, but saying that the idea of God is itself a destructive presence in human society and it should be dumped. Then as we look at the religions of earth, we can see uh, an Indian, a Chinese, and an Abrahamic family of religions, families of friends, I like to think of them that way. The Indian family is going to all believe in karma, the idea that I get what I give, uh, the idea of rebirth or reincarnation that I lived before and will live again, the idea that we're all part of one reality, not a God separate from our reality, and the doctrine of non-harming as well as the Sanskrit language unite these three traditions into one mega tradition, the Indian family. The Chinese family, we call it the land of three religions um, because one can be Taoist, Buddhist, or Confucian all at the same time, and many are. The boundaries between traditions don't exist like they do among the Abrahamic traditions. So we'll see primarily Confucius will struggle for a harmonious world on this planet, and Lao Tzu will struggle. Well, he won't struggle. He will struggle to explain the way of non-struggling, acceptance of the Tao or the way of things, and contentment and happiness with things just as they are. And Buddhism will emerge into the Chinese situation kind of like a bull in a china shop and mess with these other two, but also be absorbed by and shaped by them as well. Finally, the Abrahamic religions are those religions that students tend to think of when they think of the word religion. Even most atheists do too, but it's only one of our families. And the Abrahamic religions, of course, all three, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, go back to that figure, Abraham, whose faith in God was so strong that he was about to murder his own child at God's command until God said, basically, just kidding, I wanted to see how sincere you were. So loyalty and fidelity to this God is number one for those traditions. So students often ask me, Powell, what's the right religion? And I always say, it's the religion that makes you happy. And which one do I believe? Well, all of them, why? Because they all have truth to share and I've learned from all of them. And the study of religion is about global awareness competencies. So I like to also say to students who don't like religion or people who don't like it or see it as a bugaboo of humankind today, that if you don't like religion, you're really saying you don't like human beings, which is a fair thing to say, but even if you hate religion or human beings, you can run from religion, but you can't hide.